Acts chapter 12 is what we're in tonight. We're going to talk about the never-ending prayer meeting. The never-ending prayer meeting. There's a lot of things that goes on in Acts chapter 12. But three, things, three characters that we want to look at specifically. We want to look at James, who became the second martyr of the church. Uh, remember, Stephen was killed, and he uh, was killed by the religious crowd, the Judaizers. And uh, here comes James, and he's killed by a uh, heathen king, killed by Herod. We're going to look at him for a minute, and we're going to look at, at uh, Peter, who was strong in prison for preaching the gospel. Uh, and then we're going to look at King Herod and uh, the way the Lord dealt with him. So I want to read a song to you tonight, a song that pretty much makes hypocrites of a lot of us, okay? You don't have a hymn book, so we're not singing, so I'm just going to read the song. I might even read it in tune. I don't know. Sweet hour of prayer, sweet hour of prayer, that calls me from a world of care and bids me at my Father's throne, makes all my wants and wishes known. In seasons of distress and grief, my soul has often found relief and often escaped the tempter's snare by thy return, sweet hour of prayer. Sweet hour of prayer, sweet hour of prayer, thy wings shall my petitions bear to him whose truth and faithfulness engage the waiting soul to bless. And since he bids me seek his face, believe his word and trust his grace, I'll cast on him my every care and wait for thee, sweet hour of prayer. Sweet hour of prayer, sweet hour of prayer, may I thy consolation share, till from Mount Pisgah's lofty heights I view my home and take my flight. This robe of flesh I'll drop and rise to seize the everlasting prize, and shout while passing through the air, farewell, farewell, sweet hour of prayer. That song pretty much makes hypocrites of all of us. In 1983, I was pastoring uh, Unity Baptist Church in Wood, and I was just anxious to take a mission trip. And I was introduced to a little place called Haiti. Some of you have been there, all of you read about it. Uh, but I went, another pastor friend of me, and two gentlemen from my church, we went. We went to deliver a, a, a well pump that was going to provide the board for 12,000 people. We visited seven congregations. We uh, left, I think it was on a Tuesday. We went there for Wednesday. Thursday night, I got to preach at Calvary Baptist Church in Haiti through an interpreter and uh, had 12 people saved in the service that night. But on Friday night, we were leaving that Saturday morning to come back home. And on Friday night, we drove to the outskirts of Port of Prince Haiti. We pulled up in the yard of this old dilapidated building. You wouldn't think anybody was there, but when I walked in, there were seven pastors standing there, seven including John Edward, who was with us. They were all dressed fit to kill, all dressed like pastors. You see, clothes is not a problem in Haiti. Finding food and water is, but they get a lot of clothes from the United States. They make use of those clothes. And if you go to Haiti, you find the folks over there dressed pretty good. One of the pastors that I met, I remember his face. Don't remember his name, but I do remember a, a lapel pin that he had. It simply said, God can. Well, these ministers had been meeting for several years. In this old, as you walked in the building, the roof is about to fall in. And over about a third of the concrete floor was water standing. That was summertime, so it wasn't really a problem. But there were small metal chairs there. And we were all going to kneel down and pray. Now, I learned from John Edmund that these men had been meeting there faithfully for several years and praying from 7 p.m. to past midnight for God to send revival to the land of Haiti. Now, brothers and sisters, I want you to know I was so ashamed of myself. Here were these men that have nothing, uh, don't scrounge to have food, scrounge to have good drinking water. 
But they were praying not for food and water. They were praying for God to send his spirit to the land of Haiti. Now, let me make a confession to you. I cannot tell you when I have spent four hours on my face praying to God about anything. Now, if we were to take a poll tonight, I would dare say that most of us has never done that either. But I promised as I came back to be, become more persistent in my prayer life. And that's the key to this prayer time that we're talking about tonight that saw Peter delivered from, from, from prison. These people were persistent in their prayer. Now let me say this. They have experienced spiritual awakening. You go over there, there's churches everywhere, gospel churches that are preaching the gospel, people being saved in droves. Now they still got a lot of problems. But guess what? So does America. We got a lot of problems too. But you see, I think we're shooting at the wrong target. We're supposed to be praying for spiritual awakening. And our job is to get people right with God. It doesn't matter how much money or jingle we have in our pockets. It doesn't matter how many buildings we build. What matters is that souls find Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of their lives. But that, that doesn't happen, friends, without a persistent prayer life. And that's what this scripture talks about tonight. If you'll open your Bibles, you already got it. It begins here, chapter, uh, chapter 12, verse 1. Now, about that time, Herod, the king, stretched forth his hands to vex certain people of the church. He killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And because he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to take Peter. Then were the days of unleavened bread. And we had apprehended him to put him in prison and delivered him to four quaternions of soldiers. That's 12 soldiers now. To keep, well, actually 16 soldiers. I'm sorry, four quaternions would be 16. To keep him intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people. Peter, therefore, was kept in prison but underline these verses. But prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. Friend, let me tell you something. Persistence in prayer is something that we lack. Okay? I think we need to make a commitment unto the God of heaven to find an hour. Now, you know, I thought about this. Maybe they're talking about Wednesday night prayer meeting, that hour that we spend, but we don't even spend an hour praying that time. But we ought to become more persistent in the things that we want to see happen in our hearts and our lives and our churches. Say amen. Amen. Now, you are just like me. You scroll through Facebook, and I guess on any given day, you will see nine or ten people that say Prayers, please. Unspoken requests. Prayers, prayers, prayers. I saw yesterday a young boy who had been bitten by a rattlesnake. His foot was swollen up, and, and folks said, please pray for this young boy. Well, I stopped right there, and I offered up a prayer. But, you know, I wasn't spending an hour. I wasn't spending four hours praying for this particular little boy's healing. Now, every time I remember it, I pray for this particular little boy and for him to be healed from this rattlesnake bite. But I'm I'm convinced, brothers and sisters, that we have to be persistent in our prayer life if we really want to get anything from God. For instance, we pray for the salvation of our loved ones. Well, how many times, I know you may, well, I pray a minute here, a minute there, maybe it adds up to an hour, but how much time do we really spend along with God being persistent in praying for that one thing that we want to see accomplished? And brothers and sisters, I'm afraid in that category of the church is full of sinners. Amen? Amen? Let me read a couple of other verses of Scripture before we go on. I want you to look with me at Matthew 7, verse 9. Matthew 7, verse 9. You get it? Say amen. Amen. Jesus is, is talking about prayer. And listen to what he says. What man is there of you whom of his son asked bread, will he give him a stone? Or if he asked fish, will he give him a serpent? 
He said, Go on, if you then being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father, which is in heaven, give good things to them that ask? But I'm convinced, brothers and sisters, our shadow prayer life, which is just, you know, a passing thing. You know, shadows are passing. So that's the kind of way we do our prayer life. It's just a shadow. Minute here, minute yonder. Minute in the morning, minute at night when we go to bed. Don't get it done. We are in spiritual warfare. We're at a time, brothers and sisters, like we've never, ever experienced before. The numbers of the body of Christ are falling off. And uh, it's got a lot to do with the pandemic. It's got a lot to do with uh, people's hearts. But friends, at this particular time, we need to be consistent in our prayer life. Look at Luke 18, verse 5 with me right quick. It's another verse of scripture that talks about prayer. Luke 18, 5. This is a, a, a story. I need to start up in verse 2. There was in the city a judge which feared not God, neither regarded man. Now these words are in red, so this story is being told by Jesus himself. There was a city where the judge feared not God, neither regarded man. And there was a widow in that city, and she came unto him, saying, Avenge me of my adversary. And he would not for a while, but afterwards he said within himself, Though I fear not God nor regard man, yet because this widow, tr widow troubles me, I will avenge her, lest by her persistent and continual coming she will weary me. Now, I like King James Bible. You read some of these other modern translations, they take this completely out of uh, 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 they, 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 do a, they do a discombobulation of this. They just take it out of context. They don't use and they don't emphasize on the continual and the persistent prayer that is needed to get things done with God. Now, we are taught in Sunday school, well, just send up a prayer, you know. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray, Lord, my soul to keep. I die tomorrow awake. I pray, Lord, my soul to take. Okay, that takes what? Five seconds at the most? Friends, I believe that is why the church of the living God is powerless today. The most important thing that we do is prayer. It started out in Acts 1. It continues all the way through to Acts 12. And they continue praying for God to work in the hearts and lives of the people. Now, let's go a little further. We'll say a little bit more about this prayer. And you'll find out these people are uh, kind of like us today in a way. Well, let's just kind of read this scripture together and uh, let it speak to our hearts. We'll start in verse 6. When Herod would have brought him forth the same night, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains and the keepers before the door kept the prison. All right, so Herod had already made his plot to kill Peter. And behold, the angel of the Lord came unto him, and the light shined in the prison, and he smote Peter on the side and said, Raise up, saying, Arise, go quickly. And his chains fell off of his hands. So there's the miracle hand of God answering prayer. And the angel said, Gird thyself and bind thy sandals. So he did. And he said unto them, Cast thy garment about thee and follow me. And he went out and followed him and wist not that it was true which was done by the angel, but thought he saw a vision. In other words, Peter didn't really believe there was an angel there. He thought it was a dream. He just thought he saw a vision, not, not a real, literal, embodied <coughs> angel performing all these miracles. But uh, So he's kind of scratching his head what's going on. Because I think Peter was resolved, so well, they done beheaded James, you know, they're going to behead me too. And he went out and followed, and wished not that it was true, which was done by the angel. When they were past the first and the second war, they came unto the iron gate that leads to the city, which opens them of his own accord, and they went out, passed on through one street, and forward the angel departed from him. So, all right, point I want to make here. The angel stayed with him to the danger left. Amen. <laughs> hey, that's shouting ground, brothers and sisters. Angel didn't leave him. Didn't leave him until he was safely outside the gate. 
Now, the reason the angel's leaving him, the angel's got another appointment. This very angel's going to show up a little bit later, okay? And when Peter was come to himself, he says, Now I know for surety that the Lord has sent his angel, has delivered me out of the hand of Herod and from all the expectations of the people of the Jews. And when he had considered the thing, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark, where many were gathered together praying. Okay? Remember, they wasn't in church. Church is first day, and they all went to the houses. Well, the body of Christ got together, and they said, hey, listen, we need to pray. Uh, the sister Mary's house said, we need to start praying. Uh, now, this is the mother, of, we are told this is the mother of John Mark, the Mark that wrote the Mark's Gospel. We, and they said, we need to pray, and Peter's in jail. They've already killed James, and Herod's already sharpened the blaze. He's going to kill Peter, too, unless intercessory prayer is made on his behalf. He said, we've got to pray. You see, this became the most important project for the body of Christ. Baptist, I'm sorry, but eating watermelon and shooting fireworks wasn't their main priority. Okay? I just had to throw that in. The most persistent thing that they had was praying for someone who was facing uncertainty. Peter was a chosen vessel of God. God had already said, we're going to make you a little stone, Peter. We're going to make you powerful. Okay? But he was in jail. So what was going to happen? All right, the church made the release of Peter the priority. They didn't know what was going to happen. But they knew that God was able to deliver Peter. They didn't know how. And Peter knocked at the door of the gate, and answer came to, uh, named Rhonda. Old Sister Rhonda. Sister Rhonda opened the door, and she knew Peter's voice. She said, well, I'm standing back, Peter. Opened the gate for, uh, for gladness, but then ran in and told how Peter stood before the gate. They said unto her, Thou art mad. She, constant, she constantly affirmed that he, it was him. So when they said, It is an angel. But Peter continued knocking, and when they had opened the door, they saw him, and they were all astonished. You see, they didn't realize the power of prayer. They were just like you and I. They didn't realize that God had answered their prayer. Rhonda ran to the door. She said, this is Peter. Closed the door in his face. So Peter had to knock again. Said, Peter's out there. Said, woman, you done lost your ever loving mind. Peter's in jail. There ain't no way he's going to get loose. But what were they praying for? For him to be loose. And all of a sudden, God answered their prayer. When he answered the prayer, voila, here was Peter delivered because of the persistent prayer of the people of God. Now, I want you to get that. I want you to go home and you lay down tonight. Persistence, persistence, persistence. I have got to be single-minded. I've got to be persistent. And I have got to spend some time praying for whatever mountain that I need moving out of my life. And two or three minutes ain't going to get it done. Amen? Amen? That's good preaching. I need to take up the collection now. <laughs> All right, where were we? Verse 17. Yeah. But he beckoning unto them with a hand to hold their peace, declared unto them, Now Peter gets to preach how the Lord had brought him out of the prison and said, Go show these things unto James and to the brethren. Now that's the other James. James of, uh, of, uh, of uh, Zebedee. Wait a minute, let me, let me make sure. No, the, the James, the son of Alphys, I'm sorry. Zebedee is the one that got killed. Now, as soon as it was day, there was no small stir among the soldiers what would become of Peter. Can you imagine the Roman prison? I mean, just like over there, he was under guard of key. He had 16 soldiers around him. He was locked fast in chains. But somehow or another, he got loose. He was the first who did. But we found out the magician's trick is being right with God and having the angels at your beckoning. Brother, when you've got the angels to do your bidding, guess what? They ain't nothing, they ain't nothing that you can't get done. Remember, God sits up there and he gives angels marching orders. That's according to Psalm 91. He gives angels charge. Go look after this child of God. Go take care of this one. Go help this one during this trouble. And so we have the angels at our beckoning. Now, does that mean that we can beckon them to do our wishing? Maybe so. Maybe we can stand up and say, you know what? Angels, I need you to 
help in this situation. I don't know. I don't, I don't know a lot about angels. I just know they're all in the Bible. Okay. And when Herod had sought for him and found him not, he examined the keepers. I'd like to hear that conversation. Oh. Where is he? What have you done? You got drunk and let him loose. He must have paid you a lot of money. Commanded that they should be put to death. Well, that's the way things were in the Roman uh, government. When you failed, brothers and sisters, you went to death. And by the way, by the way, that's the reason we know that Jesus rose from the dead. Because he didn't kill those if, if, if uh, they would let his body be stolen away at the night, they would let those soldiers, they would let, let them to death instead of let them loose. And he went down from Judea to Caesarea and there he goes. So he's a free man. He keeps preaching. He's gone from Judea. He's gone to Caesarea. Uh, he's getting uh, ready to have the gospel spread throughout the world. But then we come to the verse of Scripture, verse 20, 25. Okay? Now, before we get to this, it says, and Herod was highly displeased with them of Tyre and Sidon. Okay, now, I want you to turn with me right quick and look at Psalm 105, 15, before we read the story about Herod. Okay? Psalm 105, 15. Okay? 
That's Herod Antipas II. So five Herods, okay? Another side note about Herod the Great. Since Herod was the procurator of all, of all Judea, he was the one that rebuilt the temple of Zerubbabel. Remember, it had been destroyed in war, and he rebuilt, so he was accredited with, with building the third temple. And that's the one that stood in the days of Jesus, the one that Herod the Great had built as a favor to the Jews. But anyway, now, so Herod Agrippa the first is standing out on the scene. He says, he was highly displeased with the people of Tyre and Stone. They came with one accord to him and said, having made Blastus the king chamberlain, their friend desired peace because their country was nourished by the king's country. So there's a little skirmish going on there. And upon a set day, Herod said, well, I'm going to take care of this. I'm going to stand up and I'm going to tell these people just like it is. It's just like any leader getting up and making a speech uh, and trying to soothe the people's uh, angers by, by talking rather than fighting. And so he gets up, and here's what, it, what happens. Upon a set day, Herod, in royal apparel, sat upon his throne and made an oration unto them. So you get the picture. He's standing up, he's trying to appease the people, and he delivers a tremendous kingly address. He's got all the royal guard on, he's sitting up on his throne, he has the, uh, the crown on his head, and listen how the people responded. And the people gave a shout, saying, it's the voice of a God, not of man, but of a God. Well, God is going to show you how big of a God he is, okay? Immediately, the angel. Now, which angel? Probably the same angel that had just delivered Peter, and now he was going to take care of Herod. And what happened? The angel of the Lord smote him because he gave not God the glory, and he was eaten of worms and gave up the ghost. But the word of God grew and multiplied. Wow. Now, what happened? Did all of a sudden he was just sitting up there and worms just started coming out his eyeball? I don't know. But it said he was eating of worms and he fell dead. Now, what did Herod do to get God so mad? Somebody tell me. He touched God's anointing. Okay? I don't think God was just dis displeased with him getting up there and, you know, maybe he was taking glory for being God. I don't know. But I think the thing that caused his doom and caused him to die in such a hateful, uh, horrible way was that he touched God's anointing. He violated Psalms 105, 15. Isn't that verse 105, 15? He violated that. And he was turned to work to try to turn to people. So I guess their opinion of him changed right quick. Man, they were looking on that crown, looking under the robe. They said, I don't see no man. All I see is my word. And how that transpired, I never know. But it happened. Okay? He set himself up against God. But right under that is the most powerful verse. But the word of God multiplied, grew and multiplied. Amen. 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 So when it's all said and done, the enemies of God will fall, but the word of God will stand for them. Amen. 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 And Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem where they had fulfilled their ministry and took with them John, whose surname was Mark. Now the reason they mentioned Mark is because Mary was Mark's son. So they had kind of been around there, and now he's taking Mark, and Mark is going to make one of the journeys, first missionary journey with Paul. All right, any questions or anything anybody want to add? Now, as I said a while ago, there are three Jameses mentioned in the Bible. There's James, the brother of Jesus, who I believe wrote the book of James. There were two who were apostles. And the one that gets beheaded here is the son of, uh, of Alphys. I'm sorry, the son of Zebedee. The son of Zebedee. Okay? I get those confused. you got the, son, the brother of John, the son of Zebedee. Zebedee had two sons who were, who were uh, apostles, John and James. Zebedee, remember that was one of my preaching brother's name. When he called them and they came, he listed their names. And then there was another James who was the son of Alphys. And as far as I know, he, he, still, he was still living at this time. Any questions? Well, you have been a good
good audience. I appreciate you being here, and I thank you, and I hope to see you Sunday morning. Amen. Amen. Diane, you got music Sunday. Okay. Kill Sunday. All right. Good night to all those by way of uh, Facebook. We love.